All right, looking good? Perfect. Um, well, good morning or midday, I guess, everyone. Um, I hope you all are enjoying the summer weather we're finally getting. Um, we're really excited to be at the halfway point of our 2023 webinar series. And this month is going to be a super engaging one. Um, today, we'll be talking about conservation, specifically through a scientific lens, exploring how to create diverse, healthy, and sustainable pollinator communities. Um, a bit about us as an organization, we are based in Colorado, as most of you probably know, um, and we strive to advocate for the reduction and elimination of pesticides to create and connect pollinator safe habitat and to reverse the drastic decline of pollinator populations. Um, through our efforts, we hope to see sustainable land management practices, public health safeguards, and the conservation of biodiversity implemented holistically around the state. And more broadly, we want Colorado, of course, to be a safe place for both pollinators and people. Our primary activities to achieve these goals center around education and outreach, policy and advocacy, habitat creation, and community mobilization. In today's webinar, we'll be hearing from Dr. Adrian Carper, who is a community ecologist and research associate at the University of Colorado Boulder and the CU Museum of Natural History. Uh, Dr. Carper's work focuses on native pollinator science and conservation with study species ranging from bees to butterflies. Um, he'll be discussing the value-driven nature of conservation and how it relates to efforts to conserve native pollinators. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. We are really thrilled to be able to put on free events like this every month, but we really cannot do it without your continued support. So if you're interested in donating to PPN, I'll be dropping the link to our donation page in the chat. Um, we also encourage you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date with the future events that we're gonna be hosting. Um, and you can always check our website, of course, for more helpful information and to sign up for our monthly e-news or to volunteer. Um, a few basic reminders about the webinar itself. Please just stay muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, and leave any questions you have for Dr. Carper in the chat. I will be compiling these throughout the session today and will um, be facilitating a Q&A at the end of the discussion. So thank you all again so much for your support. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carper. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, let's see, make sure I can screen share here. Hopefully everybody seeing some beautiful alpine mountain tundra up there. Yes, sir. And then I'll just... We're going to totally switch gears and look away from mountains and go mac much more to a macro scale at um, looking at our pollinators. And so thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so today's talk is kind of a little bit of a deviation from my typical type, type of talk. I don't know if um, folks have seen me speak here before. I gave a talk last year. Typically, I talk about a lot of data show a lot of data from the scientific perspective uh, about pollinators. Um, what different types of human environmental change is impacting pollinators or how they're interacting. And last year I gave a lot of talks to um, honeybee keepers associations. They were specifically interested in pollinator conservation. So they were become interested in what they could be doing to help affect native pollinator conservation in the state. And one of the things I talked a lot about was the impact of our managed pollinators. And that didn't necessarily garner a whole lot of positive responses from the community of people that raise bees. And so this talk kind of represents a little bit about what conservation is. Well, let's go back kind of to basics. Um, and it also is meant to kind of bring the temperature down a little bit. So the conversation around pollinator conservation can become really heated. And one of the things that I've noticed is the dichotomy within it. And I don't think factions within like a conservation uh, movement is a good thing. And so Going back to what conservation is, talking about it, and creating this conversation, I hope, will um, basically steer us all in the same kind of direction. And so if you haven't seen me on here before, I'm mostly a community ecologist, so I study how humans impact pollinator communities, um, not only my own research, but through training others, like undergraduates and graduate students, and how to study primarily bee communities, but also butterfly community ecology. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do, and you've probably seen this before, is to have conversations with as many people as I can about pollinators. Um, and the title of this talk, this conservation conversation, is kind of like 
loosely based around this anagram because all you got to do is switch around a couple of letters here between conservation and conversation um, to get the other word. And I think that's kind of a, uh, uh, an interesting parallel to our plant pollinator interaction networks that we study. And so on the bottom here, this cartoon of all these different plant species versus different pollinators. And you can imagine lines between plants and pollinators and how they're connected. And so conservation is connected to its anagram conversation the exact same way. And if you think about where these letters are connected, if from either one of these terms, you drop one of these letters, then the whole conversation around conservation will break down. Just like if you lose a pollinator species or a plant species from a complex network, the community of plants or pollinators could change dramatically. And so um, I think this is really important to kind of go back to basics and talk kind of fundamentally about what conservation is and why a conversation around conservation is so important. And so just grammatically speaking, conservation is just the careful preservation or protection of something of value. Um, and conversation, of course, is just what I'm doing here, albeit one-sided because it's a webinar, an informal talk in which news or ideas are exchanged about some kind of topic. And so in most of my dealings, I try to carry on really thoughtful conversations about conservation with those people who are looking for information. This could be land managers who are already managing for plant biodiversity or animal biodiversity, and they want to know about pollinators and how their current management or practices are impacting them. It could be with other researchers who are interested in incorporating pollinators into their own biodiversity research. And increasingly, it's been community members, amateur naturalists who are interested in pollinator conservation and what they could be doing or how other things are impacting pollinator conservation or things that they're interested in. And yet I think a lot of times we go so fast that we forget about the very last part of this definition of conservation, that it is protection of something of value and that we miss the point that conservation is a value driven field. And that's difficult because people value different things. And so the question when I usually am talking with people about pollinator conservation is, okay, well, what do you wanna conserve? What do you find of value or what is of value to the general public, right? Um, because some things are more valuable to everyone than others. And we often value things because they're rare or they're really scarce, right? And so to give you an example of something that's totally not related to pollinators, but definitely illustrated with people that value things differently, take my dad's busted up 1979 MGB, right? So this thing, most people would probably not find very valuable. My dad absolutely loved this car. How valuable are they? Well, um, to my dad, it was priceless, but it's pretty easy to, to ascribe a monetary value to a car, right? You can easily go to say Kelly Blue Book, look up that it's worth $600, even though my dad thinks it's priceless. And from that value, you can then start to determine what the costs are to conserve what it is that you value. And so to determine what, con what the costs are to conserve something, you may need to know about what the threats are to that which you value. So um, those threats can inform how you would protect it. From a car, for instance, well, the paint's falling off and rust is going to attack it and destroy your car unless you get a new paint job on it. Rain's gonna come straight in the top of, my, of his car because he's got no roof on it and will rust out his floorboards, right? So you may need to invest in restoring like by getting a new top, right? Or um, doing other things internally to make sure that it's an actual functioning vehicle, right? So you can actually put a monetary value on that as well. And then ultimately the reason you're gonna conserve is because there are consequences to not undertaking a conservation action. My dad had this busted, this busted ass old MG, and if he didn't do something about it, i.e. turned it into a restored or a conserved vehicle, it would eventually just rust out on the farm and he would lose the vehicle he loves, no longer be able to drive it around and it would be very, very sad, right? And so a very simple conservation value driven example using my dad's like MGB, hopefully a little bit entertaining. But the thing is that people value different things. And so whenever you're engaging in a conservation conversation, that's a quite a tongue twister. One of the things I'd always push on people is to try to make sure that you're open to how 
you value things and how your values could differ from someone else's because we value such different things. And even if we value the same, same things, we may ascribe different levels of value to those different kinds of um, things or activities. For instance, museums hire conservationists all the time, right? Conservators within an art museum may be responsible for the conservation of historic works of art. It may require not only protecting them from sunlight or exposure or from damage, but also restoring those kind of artworks. They may need touch-ups or some chemical treatments to make sure that they um, can continue to be viewed or stored within some kind of um, uh, museum. Here in Denver, we've got the Veteran Memorial Conservatory at the Denver Botanic Gardens. If you haven't been, I highly recommend you go. This conservatory literally conserves tropical plants within this giant glass, steel, and concrete dome because it's valuable to be able to see and learn and experience the biodiversity of these tropical regions here in Denver. It's quite wondrous. Not only are the plants um, beautiful and spectacular, many of them have important cultural or scientific um, implications. And so to be able to experience that right here within Denver is a pretty unique opportunity. Some people really, really value music or the arts, and we have entire conservatories devoted towards protecting the practice and enjoyment of our arts and our music, right? And so a totally different type of valuation than what we typically think of for conservation. Within the realm of natural resource management, most people are more familiar with the conservation of natural resources, things which we derive from nature and use for our own benefit, like water. Again, go back to we typically tend to conserve scarce things. Water in the West is quite scarce and we conserve it not only because it's scarce, but because we want to use it, right? And because we have to put policies into place to make sure that everybody has enough water to go around. And so to talk about a complex socio-ecological and economic issue. Um, and then even energy. Right. I think most of us are familiar with trying to conserve energy because of the vast impacts that it has on so many aspects of, of um, our natural world because of how we extract energy from natural systems and how energy is distributed through our social and economic systems. And so we can take that simple definition of conservation and basically put anything in front of it to talk about like that form of conservation. So for pollinators, it's no different. We can just say pollinator conservation and define it by that thing of which we value, which would be the careful preservation and protection of pollinator communities. And so all the different types of pollinators within a community. And yet even then people may have differences in what they think or which pollinators are valuable. Right? And so as we go through the rest of this talk, think about what I'm presenting and also what you think are the pollinators that are of the most value to you, how valuable they are to you and to others, what the costs of trying to conserve those pollinators are and what the consequences of not conserving those pollinators may be. So I primarily study bees, right? And so here's a little snapshot of just some different bees that I've taken pictures of over the years. Bees are, as most of you guys know, ecologically extremely important. They're very diverse. They've co-evolved with tons of flowers. They're also beautiful and striking and charismatic and they bring me joy. It's a hard to put an economic value on the joy that I get from photographing uh, Amel Bombus nevadensis with its gigantic eyeballs here, but it's quite a, an engaging group of pollinators. But the reality is there's tons of different groups of pollinators, right? Around the world, there are different groups of birds and bees, butterflies, beetles, bats, uh, all kinds of different organisms which interact with plants and, are, and work as their pollinators. And we're concerned about a lot of them, right? And so part of the problem with conservation is deciding who of these guys are in most need of being protected. And so um, no probably big surprise to most people that I'm going to argue that native pollinators are really important. And those are the ones that we really need to be focusing on for our conservation actions and for a lot of reasons, but I don't want to discount that all pollinators are important. 
including our managed pollinators. And it's because we depend on pollinators for things like our agricultural commodities, our crops, our foods, the forage for our livestock, um, all depend on both wild and managed pollinators for that production. Honeybee products, you can get nowhere else but having honeybees, right? Our bumblebees don't make honeycomb and honey and beeswax, um, or at least in not enough quantities that we could rear on a scale that we could harvest. And I don't wanna discount the human cultural aspect of managed bees, right? Because human bee interactions has a lot of indirect benefits, which are hard to quantify. Um, so yeah, we get honey, we get beeswax, we can make candles, all kinds of cool stuff from honeybee products. But the actual like history and legacy of human bee interactions is really quite um, diverse and across several different cultures with a lot of importance for both sustainable food systems and cropping, as well as like um, the role that honeybee management plays in bringing people to the table about insect conservation, because insects are so alien to most people um, that it takes a charismatic animal like honeybees to, to get people excited about it. And so bees in particular are extremely important. Yeah, because they make our food. You can actually put dollar amounts on some of those things. These have probably changed since this paper came out, but honeybees on average, $20 billion a year of our agricultural commodities due to honeybees like pollinating crops. Our other bees, not far behind, $10 billion. And that's probably not a very good estimate of the dependency of our agricultural commodities on it. But we do know that there are some agricultural commodities which are almost completely dependent on wild pollinators or native pollinators. Things like squashes, for instance, here in Colorado, if you want your Rocky Ford cantaloupes, squash bees are the ones that are best at pollinating cucurbits because they co-evolved with them. And they have these gigantic spaces between their hairs to accommodate the large pollen grains that squash plants have, um, which honeybees aren't very good at because they need lots of nectar to connect, to like glue the pollen together on their back legs. They're not the only ones. A lot of other crops require only native bees, things like blueberries, um, which have kind of these droopy flowers, which is hard for honeybees to get nectar out of. They need to be shaken by pollinators to rain down. Things like tomatoes, eggplant, anything that's solanaceous actually have a different type of flower altogether. Their anthers don't actually have pollen on the outside, only on the inside. And honeybees can't do this, but many of our native bees can disconnect their flight muscles from their wings and vibrate their bodies in such a way to make all that pollen rain down and pollinate those plants. And so this buzz pollination is something that only our native bees can do. Um, and, our, and those native bee dependent crops are really important for our nutritional diversity. And yet even with all these economic numbers that get tossed out with how important like our pollinators are to a food supply, they're probably a huge underestimate in terms of the value of our pollinators for humans. And it's because it doesn't take into account things like this. And so what, how do you value um, the experience of climbing in how high alpine region in Colorado to take a look at wildflowers, right? So this is my partner, Nicole, looking at some columbine up in the Indian Peaks wilderness. Very few studies have tried to quantify the impacts of pollinators on recreation and tourism. Our mountains are so beautiful because of the plant communities that are there and depend on pollinators, which then brings in people and their money to rural communities. And there's lots of not only cultural implications, but also the ecological implications of biodiversity like supporting itself. And so while we depend on them for a lot of our own reasons, the most important thing in my opinion to our native pollinators is that our environment depends on them because they maintain the biodiversity of organisms within those ecosystems. And just so that we're on the same page, I figured we would go back a little bit about what ecosystems are and what it means to be a part of one. And so Biodiversity really is what supports healthy functioning ecosystem services that benefit us and the ecosystems of which we are a part. I used to say on which we depend, but we are a part of our ecosystems. Humans are the most dominant ecological and evolutionary force on the planet to date. And everything within ecosystems is impacted by human environmental change. And so ecosystems give us a lot of good things, right? They provide us with a whole lot of different resources, water. We can harvest food directly from them. 
plants which make different types of medicines, which could be important for our own health and well-being, and raw materials to do things like build our houses with, right? All of those things benefit from having ecosystem services that are derived from biodiverse communities. They also do things like regulate different ecosystem function and properties, like um, having diverse wetlands helps mitigate all the flood control. Having a wildfire burn come through really changes those plant communities and subsequently you get more floods, right? Diverse communities also helped mitigate um, climate impacts more because they're capable of sequestering more carbon and offsetting human environmental impacts. They also do things like provide clean air and water and sustainable pollination services for all of the different kind of supporting ecosystem um, ecosystem goods and services that are necessary for having healthy communities. So um, healthy photos, photosynthesizing plant communities, wildlife, and soil microbes and animals that help the ecosystem function. And all of these things feed back in to human good, right? And so you can have cultural um, benefits from having biodiverse ecosystems, whether it be spiritual, so whether it be spiritual in nature, maybe you're really connected to um, the earth, it could just be as something as simple as biking or hiking out in nature, because it's been shown, like scientifically, that just being surrounded by more biodiverse landscapes can do things like lower your blood pressure. And so we derive both positive, um, direct, and positive indirect benefits from having healthy biodiverse ecosystems. And so there's all kinds of versions of this kind of like wheel of ecosystem services that you can find online. I kind of like this one from um, Environmental Protection Agency because they start to bring in this right here, which is the drivers of changes to ecosystems and ecosystem services. And those drivers across the board, I won't show you with a whole bunch of different data, are pretty much the same for all biodiversity and biodiversity decline land use change, so urbanization, agricultural intensification, deforestation, pollution, things like fossil fuel emissions, pesticides, and climate change, which is impacted by both of these other contributors, all are implicated in biodiversity decline and the change in biodiversity derived ecosystem services. And so the benefits that we get from healthy ecosystems and the natural resources on which we depend are all being impacted by these um, drivers of environmental change, which are human caused. And if you want to address policy to try to mitigate some of these impacts, you really need to incorporate the whole scope of how these drivers change not only the natural resources, but also the human aspect of these kinds of interactions. And so, again, um, you need this complex kind of knowledge of interactions to know how best to protect from threats or how to restore functions to those ecosystems which have already been impacted. Um, and that's no easy task. So uh, as mentioned before, I mostly study bees and bees are extremely diverse. And so these are all closely related megachylid species, species, all within the same family of bees. And yet look at all of the variation in shape and size and morphology and color, all reflective of extremely complex and different natural histories and ecologies. And these are all super closely related. There are actually a lot of different species of bees, thousands of them actually. Nearly 20,000 species have been described around the world, about 4,000 in North America, Colorado, you probably all know by now I'm preaching to the choir, home to nearly a thousand species of bee. And this includes 12 that aren't native to Colorado, like the European honeybee. And I don't wanna like pick on honeybees here cause they're not the only non-native bee. And so if you look on iNaturalist, you'll find about a dozen different species of bees within Colorado, which aren't native. Things like the alfalfa leafcutter bee, which was accidentally introduced to North America probably near 100 years ago, um, and has subsequently become an agricultural commodity and reared for things like um, alfalfa seed production for making new alfalfa crops. Um, other species, which you may be familiar with, like Anthidium manicatum, this is the European wool carter bee. If you take a picture of a bee that's guarding mints or shaving hairs off of it in your garden, chances are 80%, I'd bet, that it's an introduced species of Anthidium. Three different species of mask bees, which we'll probably never know, 
But if you ever get uh, an Eastern carpenter bee drilling to your porch, I bet you'll notice and value it slightly differently than other types of bees. And the reason I put this up there is because, yeah, we have non-native bees. And while we don't actively target conservation or management issues at most of these, we do at honeybees, right? And so we have both feral honeybee hives, which are living wild, just like these other bees. And then we have managed honeybee hives in which we can like impact conservation through how we manage them. And so I put these up, not to say that we need to negatively try to impact those populations here, but just to be aware that they are part of the bee communities, they're not native, and they probably shouldn't be the target of conservation actions. We should be focusing our conservation actions on things that benefit our native uh, pollinators. So um, we should be supporting our native pollinators. Why are they at risk? Well, there's a whole bunch of bad things going on in the environment, but also because some just by nature happen to be either rare or scarce. So take our bumblebees, um, the bumblebees of Colorado, if you've not seen it, you can, if you're interested in identifying them, you can download them from the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History for free. Um, if you look at something like the Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, these are the counties where it occurs. And this is the actual data that's been, been laid over the last time I downloaded it a few months ago. From the entire history of people studying this bee in Colorado, we only have about 2,600 known occurrences of it. And while that sounds like a lot, how many bees, so this is in the entire known universe of how many of these bees have existed in Colorado that have been published on, how many bees are in a honeybee hive? 10,000, 20,000? In terms of numbers, this is a very rare bee compared to a honeybee, right? And yet it's just one of 24 different species of bumblebee that occur across Colorado. And so these are maps, probability distribution maps that were made by a class at the at CU Denver of all the different bumblebee species. And where you see red, it's where we've found a lot of those species of bumblebee. And where it's white, there's no data. And where it's gray, there's not very much. And so what do you see in all of these different maps? Well, there's a lot of bumblebees right here along the front range, very few on the Eastern Plains, and then very few in um, other places out West. Um, if you overlay this, you can see three different species here, which are listed under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as red listed species, meaning that they should be either endangered or at risk of becoming endangered, including Bombus occidentalis. And yet these species have quite broad distributions compared to things like Bombus variabilis, of which we only have one record for the state, but isn't considered of conservation concern yet because we don't have enough data to know if we should be worried. But on the whole, bumblebees aren't doing too great. Recent papers that have looked at changes in bumblebee distributions across, say, the US and Europe, all you need to do when looking at this map is kind of look at the color. These are different quadrangles, so you know, patches of habitats, basically. And the colors correspond to the percent change in whether or not species are occurred there. So this would be a 10 to 15 percent decline or in the number of bumblebee species that were found in this region over the past few decades. What do you see across this entire map? In most of North America, we are seeing 10 to 15 to 20 percent declines in bumblebee species richness, driven primarily by climate change, making it too warm for them to exist there. When you look in Europe, the situation is even worse, right? Um, even up to 25 and 30 percent of species no longer found where they used to be found. When you look at where individual species are moving, you see a little slightly different pattern. So this is a different model that is looking at where species are being lost and where areas are actually picking up new species. Climate change is one of the biggest drivers of bumblebee distributions because they're high elevation and cool weather specialists. They evolved in the Himalayas. So as it's getting warmer, species in lower ranges are going locally extinct and moving northward into higher latitudes or upwards in elevation, away from low elevation places like on the plains of Colorado, to refugia in our high mountains. And while that may sound like a good thing, picking up new species, the species that are already at high elevations now may be tasked with dealing with new competitors with which they've never had to compete before. And so knowing what the outcomes of these kind of potential novel competitive interactions 
is really an unknown for a lot of bumblebee conservationists, but of a lot of concern. But they're not our only rare pollinators. Um, I gave this example before of the sandstone mining bee. Um, this bee is really um, geographically restricted. So while Bombus occidentalis occurs across most of the Western United States, this bee was only known from a handful of populations in Colorado up until just a couple of years ago when there was another population found in Wyoming. And there's only been about 50 published occurrences of this bee ever um, in existence. This is an exceedingly rarely found bee, and it's because it's associated not only with its nesting habitat, um, which is white sandstone cliffs, that's why it's found here in Boulder County, um, but also because it feeds only on prickly pear, Opuntia, um, hence its um, specific epithet, Opuntiae. But there are other rare kinds of bees or interactions which may be worthwhile to conserve. For instance, we already mentioned those economically important species like cactus bees, uh, uh, sorry, not cactus bees, squash bees, but, uh, and those geographically restricted species, which are also a specialist on cactus, opungiae. There are also really, really unique um, um, or ecologically significant interactions like yucca and yucca moths. If you're not familiar, yucca moths are these tiny little white um, moths, which are the only animals in this world capable of pollinating the flowers of yucca. And they've co-evolved with yucca for millions of years to um, create this really, really unique one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so if anything ever happened to the yucca moth, it's bye-bye yucca. If anything ever happened to the yucca, it's bye-bye yucca moth. And so all of these kind of complex native interactions are what really spurred you guys, right? People in Pollinator Interaction Network really to push the Colorado Native Pollinating Insects Health Study. And so um, when this thing passed, I was super stoked to see who would apply for it. And then was even more honored to be like asked to help collaborate on this really collaborative study that's doing the largest scientific review of both the, the diversity of pollinators within our state and the mechanisms that are driving those communities. And so I'm not gonna get into all of this right now because it's a work in progress, but suffice it to say, we're bringing together a huge community of scientists and researchers who specialize in pollinators, pollinator conservation and management here in Colorado um, to really help the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation put together the best management recommendations in terms of pollinator conservation specifically for Colorado that we can. And I like to throw this up there because just look at the diversity of faces and people that are on this slide. And we're not only doing it because we're interested in science, but it's because we're also concerned, right? Um, so many people have heard about the collapse of insects or declines in pollinator communities, and we're no different. Uh, many of us have seen changes over our careers, and we know because we've read a lot of papers about what some of those drivers are. As Dave Wagner said in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science paper a couple of years ago, the global threat to insects is really driven by a death by a thousand cuts, right? And so this is preaching to the choir for you guys. It's no shock that we do a lot of things across the land. We change the very surface of it for our crops. We spray all kinds of terrible insecticides and fungicides and herbicides in order to grow the things we want to grow or make our landscape looks the way we want to look. In just transforming that land, we do all kinds of things like polluting it, which increases the negative direct impacts of um, climate change and altered weather patterns, as well as doing things like introducing non-native species or invasive species, which could have both direct and indirect negative impacts on like um, our native insect communities. And so while that's really, really depressing, what's more depressing is that for some species, it may already be too late. And so many times when I give an outreach talk and ask how many endangered bee species there are, people will say, I don't know, 50, 100. Reality is there's two. And one of those, the Franklin's bumblebee, was just listed a couple of years ago, but it's probably already extinct. It hasn't been seen since 2006. And it was already one of the most regionally restricted endemic bumblebee species in the world. And now it's probably most likely not even there. And so for some, it may already be too late. And so why are we concerned about things going extinct? Just to reiterate, it's because plants and pollinators are so dependent on one another. And so in last year, I think I gave this slide in one of these talks and talked about honeybees, 
So in this plant pollinator interaction network, every one of these bars represents a different pollinator from different types of insects to even uh, hummingbirds. And every bar here is within uh, different plants within that community. And this is feral honeybees. So just across a landscape, uh, a meadow of different types of wildflower species with some level of just wild living feral honeybees in the landscape. This is what the honeybee interactions highlighted as red look like within this plant pollinator network. The width of the bars just represent the number of say interactions between a plant and a specific species. Some have very few, some have really a lot, right? So honeybees look like a normal kind of part of this community until you bring in an apiary that needs to make wildflower honey. And then, oops, I put it in the wrong place. I'll show it to you in a minute, I promise. What happens if you were to remove, let me backtrack a little bit, one of these species from this environment? And so right now, honeybees are making kind of a normal kind of interaction within this network. Um, things like global climate change or land use change can do things like cause extinctions to other species. And the problem with that is that it can lead to co-extinctions. And so imagine something like climate change making Bombus occidentalis go extinct, a plant that could be dependent on it um, could then go extinct because it's no longer got its primary pollinator. And if you're thinking about a food web, things that depend on eating, say a pollinator that went extinct may go extinct because it can't feed on it. Um, if you think in network theory, so more complex food webs or networks, you can actually have more like negative impacts because all of these linkages can actually, if they're, if they're not linked to other species at different tropic levels, cause basically cascades of extinctions throughout a network. And so the way that you can conceptualize this is that how species interact within a community can change the impact of extinctions within the community. And so things like how nested the network is, if this were all pollinators and these are all plants, if you lose one, but it's only connected to one plant that's got several different pollinators, then it goes extinct, but nothing else. If you're a pollinator that pollinates a whole lot of plants and three of them depend only on you, if you go extinct, then three of your plants go extinct. And so the best thing we can do is to build really diverse communities of both plants and pollinators that are connected across the board so that if any one pollinator species or plant species go extinct, you've got this functional redundancy where different pollinators can take up the slack and pollinate those plants. And then ultimately by building complexity into networks with lots of cross linkages, you can minimize these yellow or secondary extinctions by building lots of redundancy within our networks. The only way to do this is by having as much biodiversity within those communities as we can get. So with that in mind, um, natives are really important or risk cause they're declining and we depend on them a lot. Um, kind of the last thing I wanted to end up with was how we can kind of steer the conversation around the management of pollinators, the sustainability of managed pollinators and the conservation of our native biodiversity. And I think the very first step here is on all of us to acknowledge that the impacts management have on biodiversity. And so our land use change, our agriculture, those are all management. And we've just talked about their impacts and no one guesses that. And yet when you talk about the impacts of managed honeybees, like through changing visitation rates to flowers from native bees by literally driving them locally extinct because they outcompete them for, for native um, flower resources. Um, people get a little more squeamish, right? Um, but most studies now have shown that when we look at the impacts of our managed pollinators, they have negative outcomes for our native ones. Um, and when we manage non-native bees, those impacts are much larger than when we manage native bees. And so here's where I was trying to get with that example. Here's those honeybees, right? And they're links within a community. These are fe just feral honeybees, a natural part of the background, like network of plant pollinator interactions. Then you bring in an apiary and it totally changes it because an apiary brings in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bees, which are like visiting all of those plants, competing with different bees within the community and altering all of these complex interactions within the network. And that can have sometimes unintended consequences. And while it's hard to differentiate the individual impacts on individual species within this complex network, 
when we look holistically, there's no question that honeybees have become the most dominant floral visitors around the entire globe, even though they're only native to Europe and the Mediterranean. And so on the one hand, um, that means that a lot of our plants have likely become somewhat dependent on honeybees. But on the other hand, it means that they're probably one of the largest competitor species for our native species in terms of conservation. And so this isn't unique to, to um, native pollinators. Even honeybee keepers have noticed that there may be too many honeybees across the landscape now. And so people that are publishing books on, on how to manage honeybees are suggesting that things like the rise in urban beekeeping have created more bees in urban areas than is sustainable, right? And this is evidence through lower honey yields, higher overwinter mortality within urban areas. And it suggests that policy, policy should be considering things like limits on the number of hives that can be um, um, out on the landscape. And hive management is really an important thing that we need to be talking about in terms of our conservation, because not only could it benefit honeybee keepers directly by reducing competition from other honeybee keepers, um, honeybees rob, rob each other's hives, and when resources are low, robbing is higher. But it can be especially important for things like endangered bee species, like the rusty patch bumblebee, which the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service now recommends being, you know, any apiaries being kept at least a kilometer away from known populations of this endangered species, because not only do, do they repeat, do they compete for resources, but they do things like vector pathogens and diseases and viruses, which could um, make these endangered species even more susceptible to extinction in the long run. So that being said, I think honeybee keepers are an extremely valuable resource to have at the bee and pollinator conservation table because they were basically the canary in the coal mine, right? Um, we didn't start really paying attention to a lot of bee declines and other pollinator declines until colony collapse disorder, varroa mite, everything else started tanking our native pollinators and we started seeing, oh, what's our other pollinator communities doing and seeing subsequent declines as well. And so, when in terms of conservation, while people really value their honeybees, there are also known like hindrances to conservation because of these kinds of negative impacts on honeybees. And being aware of both of those benefits both honeybees as well as native bee conservationists. And I really see this as kind of balancing the benefits of honeybee keeping with understanding of their impacts. If you want honey or sustainable urban sugar in places that we don't have sugar cane or maple syrup or agave, um, honeybees are a great way, right? Um, but we know that they're going to have negative impact. And so what we need to do is to um, think, think thoroughly about this complex socioeconomic or socioecological um, problem. And so this trends in ecology and evolutionary paper uh, deem this the Gordian knot. So a Gordian knot is a knot that has no beginning or end because it's a uh, just a spinning wheel of feedback between these different kinds of um, socio uh, social systems. So if you think about urban beekeeping, there are lots of benefits of it, right? Aside from making honeybee products, um, it, you build communities that are centered around at least conserving what they see as a resource, their honeybees, which are important to them and they value. You get things like um, honeybee keepers associations, which can create positive environmental change. If you've kept honeybees, you're more likely to engage in pollinator conservation efforts, to donate to pollinator conser conservation initiatives, right? So there are direct conservation benefits from people engaging in beekeeping. On the other hand, we've already talked about those negative impacts. And so you really have to start to weigh the conservation risk of how many honeybees are out there or how you manage them with the benefits that are derived from encouraging or having honeybees out on the landscape. And ultimately, I think the problem that I've seen over the past few years is that people have started to adversarialize the other side. And I think this is not very productive. I, as someone who's really interested and engaged in native pollinator conservation, do not tell people they shouldn't keep honeybees. I ask the problem, why do you keep honeybees? If it's that important to you, then by all means, keep honeybees, but be reticent of the impacts that they could have. Because just for like for you, keeping your hives clean of varroa or of twisted wing virus is good for your honeybees. That's also really good for bees because they won't be vectoring those diseases. So I think we need to have more conversations around honeybees and native bees because 
through identifying shared values, I think we can increase the, effect, the effectiveness of our uh, pollinator management and our biodiversity conservation. So take for instance, this shared value. Most of us all agree that what we mostly need, especially given habitat loss, is the conservation of more abundant and diverse floral resources. And this is really great for, for honeybee uh, keepers because they can have healthier and more sustainable managed honeybee populations. And it's really great for people who are interested in native bees because we get diverse pollinator communities from all those different types of flower resources. And we can engage with a more diverse community of people who are interested in affecting conservation action. But while these two things are working independently off this shared value, they're indefinitely gonna interact. And what we need is that conversation to help inform policy as to how we mediate those differences, right? And so this scarcity issue, our plants, our flowers will always be scarce and how we divvy up access to those resources is the realm of policy. And we need that conversation about conservation and management to know how best to mitigate those differences. And so, I know this was kind of a far ranging kind of talk. It was a little off topic for me, but it's just kind of my perspective and what I foresee is like how the future conversation around these complex issues per, could proceed. And hopefully it's helped bring a little bit of this conversation back into focus. And if anybody's got questions or would like to talk about this, reach out to me individually. Otherwise I'd be happy to take some over the chat right now. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Carper. That was awesome. Um, we have a question or two already, people. If you have more questions, please do drop them in the chat. We have about 10 minutes here. Um, I have a bunch of questions as well, so I'm happy to fill with my own questions. Um, but we'll start off with, um, are there any studies showing whether residential native plant gardens make a difference for native bee populations? Um, in terms of populations, yes, actually. And so there is some evidence that even for our most endangered bee species, the rusty patch bumblebee, residential areas have become like one of the most important floral resources for them. So if you're familiar with the rusty patch bumblebee as an upper Midwestern species, it is so in decline, probably because it was so reliant on tall grass prairie. And tall grass prairie, as probably less than one tenth of 1% of that habitat remains. And so where flora resources in the upper Midwest occur now are mostly along field edges and in rural and residential areas where people have started planting for pollinators. And we've found just in the past several years, more rusty patch bumblebees in rural and in urban areas and like housing developments than they found in conservation and conserved areas. And so, yes, you can definitely make an impact. What we need to do is to have more studies that look at how, like what the time frame or the connectivity of those kind of plantings are. So things like the Boulder Pollinator um, Advocate Program and the, uh, the Corridor Project are trying to do just that. Other cities have done that as well. So I think there's a lot of future research and engagement that can, can look at those kind of issues. Awesome, thank you. I'm kind of going off of that, you said that there are only two listed species of bumblebees um, on the IUCN red list, and one of them is likely already extinct. Um, how do you think we can improve the listing of native bees on red lists like that? Um, is this like a research funding issue, just PR of insects overall? What kind of things do you think we can do to combat those issues? Yeah, so those like highlighted bumblebee species were from the International, so the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, and so while they list dozens of bumblebee species, that has no teeth, right? So it is not a binding like, like thing between governments. And a federally listed species, like a bald eagle is an endangered species, that rusty patch bum bumblebee is a federally endangered bumblebee species. We only have two federally endangered. People may be aware of this because of uh, a recent New York Times article that talked about there's a butterfly wildlife, right? It depends on where you occur. And so regulatory authority over insects at a state level has been a, a complex issue because most states have never relegated authority over invertebrates to their agencies. From a federal level, there is authority, right? And there are several like uh, uh, 
a fair number of uh, federally endangered insects, but they lag far, far behind our vertebrates, mostly, I would argue, because of values. We value like bald eagles. We value rare uh, cats. We value wolves, which just got taken off, right? And yet people have been slow to value insects because historically, culturally, socially, we see insects as pests. That's why pesticides are such a big problem, right? Because we've spent decades trying to control insects using chemical means and avoiding like the understanding of how those chemicals impact other insects, which could be of conservation concern. And so I think there's a long like legacy of like looking over insects and we're starting to play catch up now. And so people like PPAN are really important in that conversation because you are the one that are putting pressure on governments and agencies to start to change that conversation, right? And to say that we wouldn't have like bald eagles if we didn't have bees. It's a hard thing to link from say a policymaker in Washington, but absolutely true. Absolutely, thank you um, for the kudos. Um, what kinds of efforts, conservation efforts, um, whether small or large scale, have you seen to be particularly effective for pollinator conservation, whether that's habitat creation or other? Yeah, I mean, the single biggest driver of biodiversity loss for everything, including pollinators, is habitat loss. And so for pollinators, good habitat means diverse floral plantings. And so I, I get asked all the time, where can I get diverse native plants to put in my garden? <laughs> and I'll forward them on to someone else who knows better than me, like where to buy them or how to grow them. Um, but without a doubt, like if you want to in your backyard or in your neighborhood or in your community, try to get more diverse pollinators to support them is to put in diverse floral plantings. Um, and whether or not you're a honeybee enthusiast or a wild bee enthusiast, having more types of flowers, again, remember those networks will help build that kind of structural integrity um, to your pollinator community. Awesome. Well, folks, you heard it here. Plant those flowers. Create that habitat. Um, we just got a question. Can you speak to how existing native plant atlases can help with the formation of the Colorado Bee Atlas? How are we going about working our way towards a Colorado Bee Atlas and how close are we to getting one? <laughs> I've been asked that question a lot. <laughs> um, I hadn't thought about from the plant atlas to the bee atlas. That's a very um, unique perspective. Um, the problem is most of those native plant atlases that have been built on long running records of plant distributions haven't had like an equivalent record of where bees are, right? So most of where we know bees occur come from individual research studies, ecological studies in a certain place in a certain time. And so we don't really have good information historically over like the atlas type of, of, of thing, but we're working towards it. And so I've been in contact personally with a lot of other statewide atlases um, in collaboration with the Xerxes Society. Um, we have, now have some new bee researchers within the state at CSU, at CU, and other institutions which are interested in collaborating on a big atlas like this. And tools like iNaturalist are now making it um, possible that we can engage the public to have like more impact. And so I know that there is discussion right now about an Intermountain West like Bumblebee Atlas, which would include Colorado and bring on a whole bunch more collaborators. And so those things are in the work. It's just hard to say when we're gonna get them formally started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say also we had one of our previous webinars this year um, kind of focusing on the California Bee Atlas. So people are interested in learning more about that. You can check out our YouTube channel. It's um, recorded on there. Um, yeah, if people have one or two more questions, um, let me know, but I'll just keep going with my questions. Um, are there any kinds of conservation measures in place to specifically target improving or maintaining functional redundancy in native pollinator communities? Like, are you looking at certain genera or something of um, bees that might have more connections, I guess, in the web? Um, and trying to conserve those specifically, or is that not really for the conversation? It's actually a really good point. And so here at CU, for instance, um, there's a professor who studies specifically plant pollinator interactions. 
And while his work is mostly theoretical, in other words, going out in nature and looking at it, not necessarily applied, it's had some interesting implications. Because what we talked about in terms of those networks is that having redundancy, a lot of like overlapping networks is really important. And who do you think does that better? A specialist pollinator or a generalist pollinator? So from a conservation perspective, we typically think of specialized pollinators as being more important because they may only rely on one plant or two plants, right? But in terms of functional redundancy and ecosystem stability, those generalists are the ones that makes all those links, right? And may be really important in kind of structuring a community. And that's really important from a conservation perspective because we tend to want to track rare things more to know what their conservation issue is. And yet from a sustainability perspective or an ecosystem stability perspective, maybe we need to be paying attention more to those common species, which are really important in holding the entire network together. I'd argue that what we really need are ways to kind of ensure that we have both. And so if you want to make habitat, yeah, putting out, you know, a specialist plant, which is, has its specialist pollinator is good, but you also need to put out all those asters because they're so good at supporting those like generalist species, which could also be helping those other specialized ones. And so, yeah, as far as I know, no real conservation stuff that delves directly with those things, but I think it's going to be uh, um, something that gets folded into conservation initiatives in the future. Make sure we are looking out for the common bees. Totally. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. If people have to hop off, that's totally fine. Um, but we've gotten this one a little bit throughout the presentation. Um, can you speak at all to how wildfire mitigation efforts might impact pollinators? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a couple of direct and indirect ways. Um, if people have seen other talks of mine, you know that uh, about a third of our species of, of wild bees in Colorado nest in cavities in wood. And the primary like wildfire management technique is fuel reduction, which means getting rid of your wood. And so um, not a whole lot is known. There have been some studies that looked at that and where you remove wood, you may get fewer wood nesting species, but concurrently you'll have more flower diversity. Right, so getting rid of you know brushy stuff and trees and opening up to grasses and forbs can lead to increases in the diversity of flowers and subsequently pollinators that are there. But it could be changing the structure of the pollinator community away from things like cavity nesting to ground nesting um, or to aerial nesting. And so there's not been a whole lot of work done. Most of the work on fire has been done on fire impacts directly, but not necessarily on fire mitigation impacts on communities. Um, but I think there's probably a sweet spot. Um, and so just like in anything, some moderate level of disturbance is good at fostering like diversity. And so from our wildfire perspective, I think, you know, definitely piling that wood up to keep it from like uh, the wildfire from reaching your house, then the question is, do you need to remove the wood or is it safe in a pile? Or how could we do it heterogeneously across the landscape so we don't over impact the entire landscape all at once, but maybe offset it by years or the timing of removal um, so that you minimize like getting rid of like uh, overwintering bees or something like that. I think it's going to be an area of a lot of interest. Um, you can look up Seth Davis's lab at uh, CSU, if you're interested in his work on wildfires and potential wildfire mitigation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we are a little bit past time. Sorry, guys. Um, thank you again, Dr. Carver. This was an amazing talk. We had a lot of great feedback in the comments. People are really liking this one. Um, it will be, well, it has been recorded. We will be posting it to our YouTube channel, so you can go watch it again if you're interested. Um, you will be receiving the PPAN e-news since you attended. If you want to unsubscribe, that's fine. Just, it's super easy. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Carper. You're Have a great well. rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much.